All right, welcome to the boy of the painted cave. So today we're going to be starting chapter one. All right, so this is how it is going to work. Um, every day you will come to um, this PowerPoint, which can be found in Otis under your lessons tab. So I put it in both um, the language and literature and the individuals and society. So whichever one you click on will work. So if you go to your lessons tab, you could click on either one of these. I'll just click on this for the example. Um, and you click into this boy of the painted cave read alouds. It's going to take you to this PowerPoint presentation um, where every day um, there'll be a video of me reading the chapter to you. Okay. When you are done reading the chapter or excuse me, listening to the chapter, you're gonna go back to Otis and in your assessments tab, you're gonna find these questions from Boy of Painted Cave chapters one through four. So you're gonna come back to this every day this week. So today, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, um, every day after the chapter to answer just a couple of quick questions. Okay, so when you click on that, it's going to look like this. So there's questions for today's chapter one, questions for chapter two, questions for chapter three, and chapter four. Okay, so only two or three questions per chapter. Um, you'll wanna click submit on this assignment after Friday. So once you are completely done with all the questions for the entire week, that's when you would go and click submit on that assignment. Okay, for now let's jump into chapter one of Boy of the Painted Cave. All right, here we go. So um, the PDF link is at the bottom of each one of these slides. So if you click on that PDF link, I'm trying to click it. I have this in the way. Yep, perfect. We'll go ahead and click open the story. Today we're just reading chapter one. Boy of the Painted Cave by Justin Denzel. So if you do have the actual book, you could follow along in your book. Um, if not, you'll just uh, watch on these uh, this PDF. Okay. Here's a little map with some of the animals that you're going to be seeing in this book. All right, and then here's a little author's note if you would like to read that later. All right, chapter one. Tao looked out across the valley with its endless waves of yellow grass rippling under the late afternoon sun. He could see the small band of hunters walking ahead, turning over logs and stones, searching for ground squirrels, moles, and grubs. Dirt matted their dark beards, burrs and stickers clung to their bearskin robes. They had been out three days, but the hunting was not good. Now they were returning home, tired, almost empty-handed. The boy watched as the hunters disappeared over the brow of the hill. All day, Tao had waited for this moment. With a rabbit in his hand and a leather pouch filled with moles and field mice dangling from his belt, he quickly hobbled over to the foot of the high embankment, where a smooth expanse of white sand had been washed down by the melting snows. He looked around once again. He took a deep breath and placed the rabbit on the ground. Then, with the point of his spear, he began tracing the shape of the rabbit in the sand. He worked hurriedly, starting with the head, running the spear around the ears and along the back and stubby tail. When he came to the legs, his hand slipped, causing the spear to gouge a hole in the sand. He broke off a nearby willow branch and brushed away the drawing, then started over again. This time he worked carefully, guiding the spear along the natural curves of the animal's body. When it was finished, he stepped back, studying it for a moment. He shook his head. No, it did not look like a rabbit. It was too stiff, not real. He felt a flush of anger and he shoved the rabbit aside. He looked over his shoulder again and to be sure he was alone. He knelt down on the sand. With his fingers of his right hand, he began to draw a picture of a bear. This he was sure he could do. 
Working from memory, he drew the huge head with its open mouth, showing the row of sharp teeth, the small round ears, and the short snout. As he worked, a warm feeling welled up in him. He forgot the hunters and the rabbit. He thought only of the big brown bears he had seen digging for roots in the marsh grass or scooping salmon out of the icy creeks down in the valley. He remembered their strong shoulders and shaggy brown coats. And for a moment, the image became a living beast flowing from his mind through his hand directly onto the sand. He finished his drawing by sketching in the high arched back and sturdy legs. Then he stood up, brushing the sand from his knees. He looked down at the drawing, smiling broadly. It was good, he thought, the best he had ever done. Yet with time and practice, he knew he could do better. He did not remember when he first began making pictures. It must have been many summers ago when he lived with Kala. At first, she was frightened of this. It was taboo, and she tried to stop him. Then she let him go, but he could draw only on the dirt floor within the skin hut where he would not be seen. Suddenly, his thoughts were interrupted by a soft rustling sound. With a shuffling of his deerskin boots, he stamped out the picture and dropped quietly into the patch of tall grass. He waited, his heart pounding. He knew he could be severely punished, even banished, if he were caught making images. Except for a chosen few, it was a strong taboo and against the secret rights of the clan. Yet he longed to be an image maker, to be a cave painter like old Greybeard. He knew it was a foolish hope. He was born of no shaman. He was the son of no chief or leader. He was only Tao, the boy with a bad foot. He did not even know his own father. His mother had died long before he could remember, and there was no elder to help him. Because of this, and because of his bad foot, he knew he could never become a chosen one. Whenever he saw the bison out on the plains, or the giant aroach and cave lions, he wanted to paint their pictures on the wall of the secret cavern, a magic place far back in Big Cave where only the chosen ones could go. Often at night, he lay in front of Kala's hut listening to the crackling fire and looking up at the sky. He saw pictures of deer and horses amongst the stars. By day, the billowing clouds became herds of antelope or the lumbering shapes of the mountains that walk, the mammoths. Always during the hunts, he lagged behind the hunters and watched the giant vultures tracing lazy circles beneath the clouds or to catch a glimpse of a woolly rhino outlined against the horizon. Sometimes seeing these things make, made him lightheaded, almost bursting with joy, and he wanted others to see him as the heated. He knew that Garth and the other hunters would not understand this. Even Volt, the leader, looked upon him as an idler and a dreamer, unworthy of respect or manhood. He liked Garth best of all, because sometimes the big black bearded man tried to help him, but when the other hunters came by, Garth often turned away and had other things to do. Once again, Tao heard the soft rustling sound in the grass. He waited, afraid to move. Then slowly he crept towards the sound, searching through the grass until he found the trail of pug marks going around in circles. He gripped his spear tighter and fingered the leather pouch hanging from his belt. He was sure the scent of the dead mice had attracted a hungry animal, and he had an uneasy feeling that he was being watched. He waited silently, listening. Off in the distance, he heard the harsh, scolding caw of a raven. That was all. He started walking again along the foot of the cliffs, heading back for camp. He had only gone a few paces when the rustling noise came again. This time, he turned quickly, ready to defend himself. Then he saw it, peering at him through the shadows, a young wolf, its slitted eyes low and threatening. Tao hunched down and raised his spear. If it was only one wolf, it would be an easy target. He started to throw. Then he noticed the animal swaying back and forth on unsteady legs. Weak and half starved, its ribs showed and the scraggly patches of gray hair. Its yellow eyes looked up at Tao with a vacant stare. It was only half grown, and Tao was sure it must have been deserted by the pack. Slowly, the boy lowered his spear. 
He could not bring himself to kill this helpless animal. Besides, such a scrawny beast would be a poor prize to take back to the clan. Tao put out his hand, speaking softly to the frightened animal. Come, he said. I mean you no harm. You are hungry and I have food. He held up one of the dead field mice, but the young wolf backed away. A faint snarl curled on its lips, saliva dripping from its mouth. Tao slit the mouse open with his flint knife and dangled it in front of the wolf. Again, the animal cringed and shielded away, its thin legs trembling. Here, said Tao, eat, you are hungry, do not be afraid. With careful aim, he tossed the mouse on the ground in front of the wolf. The little animal came closer, slowly, one step at a time, its yellow eyes watching the boy intently. It nuzzled the dead mouse, pushing it around, licking at the oozing fluids, yet it still refused to eat. Tao shook his head, puzzled. It was growing dark now, and he had to get back to the clan people with the rest of the field mice. He felt badly about leaving the little wolf, but he could not take him with him. He left the gutted mouse lying near the wolf's muzzle. As he started to back away, the little animal looked up at him with pleading eyes. Tao shook his head sadly, but there was little more he could do. He made his way between the huge boulders that littered the foot of the cliffs. Born with a bad right foot, a foot that bent down and turned in slightly, Tao walked with a limp. However, by curling his foot around the shaft of his spear, he had learned to travel with greater ease, and when in a hurry, he could vault over the hills faster than a running man. Now, because of the darkness, he went slowly, picking his way through the weaving shadows. He continued on through the oakwood forest until the fires of the little camp came into view. Here in the clearing, a small group of skin huts was set up under the shelter of a massive rock overhanging, jutting out from the limestone cliffs. High above, Tao could see the great fires of the endless flame burning brightly, lighting up the entrance to Big Cave. A white haze of smoke filled, filled the clearing and flickering camp fires lit up the darkness. Tao smelled the odor of cooking meat. Fat dropped from the spits, sizzling on the hot coals as the women grunted to each other and roasted a few ground squirrels and moles the hunters had brought back. Children sat on their haunches in front of the huts. They had been many months with little food, and their sunken eyes looked up at Tao. He knew his handful of field mice would not go far to ease their hunger. He glanced quickly at Volt's bare skin hut in the center of camp hoping the big leader would not see him. Then he went directly to the edge of the clearing where two bison skin robes were lashed securely to a frame of cross poles, forming a ragged hut. He knelt down in front of it and called softly, Kala? The flap opened and an old woman peered out. Her square face was lined with wrinkles. Strings of gray hair hung down over her eyes and she held a child in her arms. She smiled broadly her big teeth yellow from chewing deer hide and spruce gum. You are late, she said, but you are safe. Tao nodded and held out two of the mice. We traveled far, he said, but we did not get much. The woman took the mice in her brawny hands and held them up by the tails. I still have some dried grubs, she said, and some roots. With these, I can make a meal for the little one. The little one was a girl, child, an orphan from the winter famine. If it had not been for Kala, the elders would have taken her up among the boulders and left her for the hyenas. By caring for her, she had saved the child's life, much as she had done for Tao. Now you have another, said Tao, smiling, touching the old woman's shoulder. The woman thought for a moment. Three so far, she said. You are my first. Tao remembered it well. She had risen him as her own when others had turned their backs because of his bad foot. He stayed with her for 12 summers, learning much of, from her wisdom and kindness. The sun is getting warmer, said Tao. Soon the hunting will be good and there will be enough to eat. He said it even though he feared it might not be true. Perhaps Greybeard would come and paint images in the secret cavern. If the spirits were pleased, great herds of horses, deer, and bison would fill the plains and forests. The people would eat well, and the clan would thrive. There would be many pelts with which to make new robes and boots, 
ivories and antlers to make needles, spears and knives. Kala and Tao talk for a few more minutes. Then the woman listened and put her finger to her lips. Go, she whispered, before Volt comes. <clears throat> she went back into the hut and closed the flap, and for a moment Tao could hear her humming to the little one as she started the meal. Tao went to the center of camp near the large fire to turn over the rest of his field mice. He was almost there when a dark shadow fell across his path. It was Volt, the leader. The big man planted himself in front of the boy. His sheepskin robe was singed and stained with spots of blackberry. He wore a necklace of bear claws. His dark beard was wild and unkept. Tao felt a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach, but he stood firm. In the light of the fire, he saw the man's left cheek gashed with livid scars that always turned his face into an ugly scowl. The man pointed a fat, hairy finger at the boy and grunted, Where have you been? Tao hesitated, at first not knowing what to say. I stopped by the meadow. The big man, girl, gr the big man grumbled. You are always late, always behind the others, dreaming, wasting time. You are a poor hunter when the people are hungry. Tao saw the other hunters gathering around, attracted by the harsh words. Good, thought Tao. Now he would tell them about the wolf dog. Wolf dogs were taboo, but he didn't have to tell them that he tried to feed it. Maybe the others would listen. I heard a noise in the high grass, said the boy eagerly. I wondered what it was, and I thought... Volt shook his head and interrupted gruffly. Enough, he shouted. We do not need wandering. We do not need thinking or dreaming. We need food. The heat of anger flushed in Tao's cheeks. This man was like a mountain. He would listen to nothing. His words were always harsh and sullen. He would tell him no more. He handed Volt a pouch full of field mice. The big man grunted again, glaring down at the boy. And where's the rabbit? Tao's body stiffened. He had forgotten the rabbit. Volt stepped closer, his eyes narrowing. You ate the rabbit? The other hunters crowded around the boy. You ate the rabbit? Volt repeated, his voice taunt. Tao shook his head, unable to speak. Garth, the black-bearded one who was always with Volt, knocked him to the ground. Tao lay there in the firelight, looking up at the tight ring of spears. No, said Tao, trying to catch his breath. I would not eat while others are hungry. Volt brushed the back of his hand across his scarred cheek. Then where is the rabbit? Tao squirmed, the sharp stones pressing, pressing against his shoulders. I, I forgot the rabbit. I left it back in the meadow. Garth looked down at him, frowning, shaking his head. The men with the spears moved closer, Garth's shadow falling across Tao's face. He saw the dark anger in their eyes. Volt pushed them aside. Wait, he said. There is a better way. He pointed off into the darkness where the tops of the oak trees were black against the purple night. Go, he ordered. A sneering grin spread across his face. You say the rabbit is in the meadow. Go then, find your rabbit in the meadow and do not come back until you do. Maybe then you will learn to keep your mind on the hunting. Tao got to his feet slowly, brushing himself off. He felt a bitter surge of anger. Anger at himself for his own carelessness. Anger at these men who would not listen. As he walked, as he walked out of the camp, he saw one of the clan women reach into the fire and pull out a flaming willow torch. She handed it to him, and in the light, Tao saw it was Kala. He wanted, wanted to speak, but she nodded slightly, her deep green eyes warning him to be quiet. Tao slowly made... Slowly, Tao made his way through the oak forest until he came to the foot of the cliffs bordering the grasslands. He held his torch high, limping across the dried-out stream bed and across the scattered boulders. Once or twice, he was sure he heard something moving in the grass, but when he turned around, all he saw was the dancing shadows of the stunted willow trees. He was tired now and hunger gnawed at him, but first he had to find the rabbit. He followed the cliff until it came to the meadows and looked around for the patch of sand. In the eerie light of his torch, the darkness closed in and everything looked the same. The rocks, the bushes, the clumps of grass. 
Finally, he found the sand patch and the scuffed out drawings he had made that afternoon. He poked his spear around in the torchlight his, and his heart sank. The rabbit was gone. And in its place were the pug marks of a large hyena. Now he knew he could not go back to camp. Not tonight. Maybe not tomorrow. Not until he found another rabbit. All right, everyone. That was the end of chapter one. So um, you'll go to Otis. You'll click open your assessments tab. And in your language and literature class, there's questions from the Boy of the Painted Cave chapters uh, one through four. So remember, you're going to come back to this every day. There's two questions here for you. You'll put your answer on this side of the form. Okay. When you are completely done on Friday, um, so you're done with chapter four questions on Friday, that is when you'll hit submit. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you again for chapter two tomorrow.